welcome everybody. If everybody will come in and get us uh, sat down. Aaron's here to talk to us about Linux containers. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I'm Aaron. Uh, I've been doing security a while. Uh, ISEC, if you don't know who NCC Group is, ISEC, Marasano, uh came together. We were brought by NCC Group from the UK, um, but same people, same place. Uh, I've given some talks before on some different things. Um, so this is my first DEF CON talk, but it is my 12th DEF CON. And this is my, uh, my uh, 10 second promotional, uh, s motivational slide um, to not wait as long as I did and not be a slacker. Um, and if you're, you know, you've got an idea and, you know, we got lots of inspirational talks and cool talks here, you know, keep that going and do research and submit to the CFP and, and give talks and don't, don't wait as long as I did. So uh, I want to start with this story. So Bob, this is Bob here, uh, he's got some web app uh, or he's got something that's on the internet. Uh, it's on Linux and somehow there's a, there's a bug. Uh, he gets popped, there's some kind of RCE, he gets arbitrary code execution, something like that. Um, and he wants to add some security, but he's not really sure. So somebody says, well, you should, you should use chroot. Uh, that's legit. Uh, you know, S open SSH uses it, it must be good, right? Uh, but, you know, as we all know, it's, it's broken if you have root. Um, you essentially just chroot yourself. Uh, and then you can go up to the root um, and yeah. So it, that's well, well known. So then somebody else comes along and says, oh, well, you should SE, use SE Linux, right? That, that, that's, uh, that's easy. Uh, the NSA made it, uh, it must be secure, <laughs> Snowden. Um, it's a, you know, if you know anything about SE Linux, it's a, it's a super complicated type-based system. It's really designed for multi-level security. It's really designed for kind of government things when you've got lots of different things to classify. Um, it's got really good support on, on Red Hat, but other than that, it, it's, it's, you know, not so great. Um, some of those reasons, right, complexity, it's, it's really complicated to, to actually create it. Uh, it has the Linux Torvalds problem, which, which most of the other Linux security modules have where, uh, you know, he doesn't really believe in any of them. The set and force zero problem where, you know, if you log into a box that has SE Linux, the odds of it being disabled uh, are, are high. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the kernel's got a kernel, right? So if there's a kernel vulnerability and SE Linux is being enforced by the kernel, uh, it just gets turned off. If you ever look at any of Spender's exploits, uh, he loves to just do that first um, and then dig at them uh, as he does. But speaking of Spender, so somebody else comes along to this, uh, to Bob and says, no, you should use GR security. That's, that's the best. Um, and yeah, it, it really is in a lot of ways. But that's not really solving some of the problem, right? If he has WordPress and he's got some arbitrary, um, you know, command injection, GR security is going to do nothing for that, right? You're, you're doing a lot of memory corruption protection. You're doing a lot of, of other things. But unless you, you do all the kind of turn everything to 11 with, with RBAC and everything, uh, that's not going to solve that. So then somebody else says, no, you should use a, just use VMs. Um, you know, that, that's how to be ultra secure. But at the end of the day, you know, VMs aren't perfect either and you've got a lot of other problems with configuration management and everything to do there. Um, so the second story is, is Glenn. Um, he, he knows a lot about security. <coughs> uh, he uses CryptoCat. And so he, uh, he talks to this potential source um, and he's really, really paranoid. Uh, he wants to, to, uh, to run Linux because, you know, he doesn't trust uh, OSX. Uh, he doesn't take that seriously and, you know, malware is on Windows or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, all the cool kids run Linux and it's got to be super secure, right? But not really. I mean, he's one uh, Tor browser bug exploit away from having his calculator popped or, or whatever may happen. Uh, you know, libpurple track record is an awesome. Um, last time I updated my live CD, uh, that didn't go so well. So the third story is, uh, is Margaret, right? Margaret works at an uh, IoT company. Uh, she is tired of getting these, uh, everything running as root and everything getting popped and not having to be able to see any kind of security on this, this little platform. Then uh, I actually inserted this slide uh, after I saw Charlie uh, and um, Chris's talk where, you know, maybe Margaret also works on the GBU Connect team and doesn't want to run Dbus as root and have just come, you know, no, no ability to, to control things. But really, you know, a lot of that's done just because Money, obviously, uh, takes time to add security. 
there's no, you know, uh, there's no way to virtualize something that's on the, that's on ARM or MIPS or you know this little embedded thing that's running Linux. You know, you, a lot of these other things are too heavy-duty solutions. Uh, there's got to be something we can do. And really, these stories have in common attack services, right? You know, that's the worst attack service possible there at the bottom. But really, you know, attack service is really important. And sandboxes and containers. It would be great to see them being the norm, not the exception, right? If you look at Chrome and Adobe Reader X, uh, Seatbelt, you know, any, any of the like kind of modern sandboxing environments, that really should be everywhere. There's, there's, there's a battle that we're fighting with native code and you're going to lose, right? Uh, and so until we can win and everything's rewritten in some crazy rust or whatever it may be, um, we have to cut our losses and we can do that with containers, you can do that with sandboxing, you can do that with uh, other isolation. So for Linux, you know, uh, open source loves to, to reinvent the wheel. But how I'd like to, to kind of set this up is, you know, being in Vegas, one of my favorite movies, uh, so there's this, this movie, um, Boondock Saints, where, uh, you know, they come out of this house and they're staring at six guys uh, with guns drawn. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a firefight to, to, uh, to paraphrase. And there's this, this kind of bumbling investigator that says, you know, what if it wasn't six guys with six guns, but one guy with six guns? And, you know, he's kind of an idiot, so William Defoe is, is, is William Defoe, and he says, uh, you know, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. But really, Greenlee was right. It, it was one guy with six guns. Um, so, you know, the question is proposed, what if it wasn't a whole bunch of kernels, but one kernel with multiple user lands? And that's really the core idea of containers, right? So this also is not a new idea. This has been done a long time before um, Docker and everything came along. So before we keep going, I just want to say that this is, if you are really scared about security or incredibly paranoid and you have some, you know, ridiculous system, you do not want to rely purely on any kind of containerization solution. You don't want to rely purely on any virtualization solution. You know, you, you need guys with, with uh, guns and fences and, and uh, you know, air gaps, actual air gaps, not, not uh, things connected by wires. And really, uh, you know, I don't want, I'm not up here to say that, that containers uh, can do everything. Um, but what I am here to say is that you don't want to depend on any one single method. And containers are getting a lot easier. They're getting a lot powerful, more powerful. Um, and if you can do anything, you might as well just add things in layers, uh, as, as we've seen. So to get to how this actually works, so the first major area is namespaces. So within the kernel, uh, just like a lot of any, any other cool stuff on, on Unix, it really started in Plan 9, uh, where they, they had the idea of namespaces in the first place. But the Linux kernel is split up into these kind of five namespaces, network, mount, user, UTS, which is host name, and PID and PID. And the way you get into one of these namespaces is you, when you clone, when your process clones and, you know, spawn a child, it's kind of the new fancy fork. Uh, the, the kind of phrase that, that you get set up into is you enter, you enter a new kernel execution context. Um, and the way you do that is by when you run when you call clone, you add these special flags at the end, uh, depending on the namespaces that you want to enter. And so the mount namespace was added first a long time ago. It basically lets your process have a per process view of what the file system is. IPC, uh, we can keep going through these. Name, you know, your, your uh, processes can have their own host name. They can have uh, their own view of the other processes. Um, and they can be nested and they can, you know, there's some cool tricks you can do. Uh, if you look at how this actually works, um, you know, if you create a container and you run PS in it, you pretty much just see the processes that are in your container. Um, which leads me to the, the awesome snake oil solution. Uh, you can't hack what you can't see. Um, so the new, uh, there's also a network a namespace that, you know, isolates your IP, your, your uh, firewall, your routing table, all that kind of thing. Uh, and the user namespace, which is the newest one, uh, which was added, that uh, is really important for securing your containers and essentially lets you be root inside of a container, but that's still treated as a, a low rights user uh, in the context of the kernel outside of the container, um, which obviously is also a high risk area of the, of the container, right? You're, you're really controlling a lot of how the, the UID system works within the kernel in very sensitive areas, and so there have been a few 
vulnerabilities of you know, using the user namespace uh, to um, break things outside the context of, of containers. Um, the way that looks is you know, if you attach to uh, our foo container, if you, uh, your root you can see inside, you run sleep, and then outside of it you're actually UID 100,000. Essentially just shifts all your UIDs up by some, uh, some offset. So the other major area of containers is capabilities. The idea of capabilities is you take the uh, user root, right, who can do everything, and you blow that up into a whole bunch of little pieces. Uh, you know, whether you need to bind to something lower than 1024, whether you need to uh, be able to run ptrace, whether you need to be able to, you know, uh, change your network settings. Uh, and capabilities are great, right? That lets us get rid of this just kind of god mode and uh, split it up into a whole bunch of little pieces that really um, can do you know, only what the, you want the process to be able to do with root. Uh, the bad thing is that they started lumping them together a bit in weird ways. Uh, and so you end up with kind of a capabilities model that somewhat works but is confusing, hard, uh, and uh, can be messed up. So some of the, the uh, you know, kind of dangerous capabilities or, or, or uh, capabilities that you might commonly encounter are things like being able to receive raw packets or bind to something thousand, lower than 1024 or change resource controls or um, send um, uh, kill. Uh, so everyone always asks, you know, what capabilities should be dropped? You know, should I drop uh, this or that? Um, and really you want to drop all of them. You want to set up everything for your container or your namespace ahead of time and then when you pivot into it, you want to throw away all your capabilities and just live in your little cocoon um, and you can't do anything at all. Uh, and then you, you know, get questions on forums or, or, or even just people as implementing this, you're thinking like, well, what if I just leave this one capability enabled, what happens? And the answer is it depends. Uh, so if we, uh, if we go and look at an example of this, so we look at ping, ping is set UID root, right? Everybody from forever ago remembers that, you know, like CD record was set UID root and you could pop shells on Linux and do privesc by doing, you know, any kind of set UID root binary with a vulnerability, you get instant root. So it's kind of ridiculous that ping, you know, on these days still has root and the set UID root. Obviously the attack surface of ping has been pounded on a bunch. Um, if you copy ping to somewhere else, you'll lose your set UID root bit. And if you try to run that ping, uh, you'll get operation not permitted because you need to be able to create raw sockets for ping or ICMP. So uh, the way to fix that is you can set a capability of capnet raw on that new uh, elf. Uh, if we, you know, look at that, we can see that we have capnet raw, and then when you try to run it, even as a low rights user, now I can ping, but that's the only thing I can do. Uh, that's the only capability that I have. So obviously there's a lot of dangerous capabilities that you don't want to give things. Being able to road a kernel module, that could be bad. Uh, being able to override, um, you know, discretionary access controls or uh, turn off the mandatory access control system, uh, you know, things like that, that that's definitely things you don't want to have. The other bad thing is there's this, there's a capability cap sysadmin and obviously that sounds pretty important. It's basically root. Um, there's a whole lot of things that cap sysadmin can do. Um, there's also a great post by Brad Spender uh, that goes into all the detail and all the different capabilities and how they can be used to get root or do bad things um, and uh, that's the link to it. Um, and uh, So the other major aspect of containers is control groups. Uh, the basic idea of those is they're hierarchical and inheritable system for controlling resources across a set of processes, processes. And uh, that can be devices or CPU usage or a physical CPU, uh, memory amounts, uh, I.O. rates uh, of a certain device, network, and it's really you limit on steroids rates if you want to think about it that way. And th it's mainly used to kind of fill the gaps of some namespaces. So right now there is no dev namespace or uh, there's no namespace. Um, so you kind of have to get around that a little bit by using C groups uh, in, in a way that, that someone intended to do that but not, but not really. Um, they're typically controlled through a, a procfs file or you know proc tile style file system you know pseudofs so uh, it's just you know a, a, a directory and you put you know create directories and, and this corresponds to pids and 
things will read that directory. The good thing is that obviously that it's a file system based and you know everything on Unix is a file, it used to be at least, <laughs> following that model but uh, at the end of the day you know you can do tricky overmount attacks and other things that uh, is a side effect of having it be a file. So uh, it's, you know, it can be controlled through, you know, CG eject, CG manager, but really most of the container platforms will abstract this away. So when you put all that together, you know, namespaces isolate the kernel, com the uh, elements of the kernel, the capabilities, you know, help enforce those namespaces uh, and limit the, the, you know, capabilities within that container uh, and then the C groups limit the access. So really that, those three elements along with some other, you know, uh, secret, you know, magic sauce will create containers and it is better than ch root, right? There's a lot of background to those. You get special mount options, you know, you can do things like an overlay file system where, you know, part of the directory is shown to the container and part of it's shown to the host and there's kind of some go in between. You can do crazy stuff with SSHFS now. Um, so where are Linux capability or, you know, where, where are containers being used now on servers? So a lot of platform as a service systems, you know, EC2, you can do Docker, uh, Google App Engine uh, uses, uses containers, Heroku has been doing it for way before anybody did, uh, and they, you know, Rackspace, everybody, um, probably more that I don't have on that list. It's also being used in clients. So, you know, Chrome OS is a huge uh, user of these technologies. Uh, they've done a lot of work, hard, uh, hard work on making, you know, awesome sandboxing in Chrome and Chrome OS. Um, it's somewhat used in Android, it's somewhat used on some Linux distributions. Um, there's also some cool uh, sandboxing tools if you're into those uh, that use these without kind of going to full blown containers. So the kind of major one that, that started on the, the kind of path of Docker and the, the current trend was LXC. So LXC is kind of vanilla and I won't go into the all details of, of this but essentially it's controlled through a template, you know, you set various options you know, what devices you want to have, uh, some security different, some security uh, um, things like set comp and, and app armor or, you know, what capabilities you want to keep or drop. There's also been some recent advancement, uh, and I say recent within like the last year or two, uh, uh, of containers. So unprivileged containers, I mentioned that the user namespace, so that really creates the ability for a non-privileged user to create a new container that they can then be root in but is all treated as a non-root user when it comes when it, you know comes down to it. Uh, obviously, there's some weird things that can happen with that situation. So there's more work and auditing needs to be done there. But that'll be you know a futuristic thing where you know a low rights user that doesn't have root and never will get you root will be able to create containers and do things. But you have this problem, right? We talked about attack surface. So syscalls, right, are one of the main entry points to to the kernel. Uh, there was a lot back in 2.2, now there's a whole lot more. Uh, what are all those and does your app really need all those, you know, 300 and of some odd syscalls? Probably not. So then this thing came along called setcomp and the guys at uh, Google Chrome team are doing a ton of awesome work uh, to really push the boundaries of what you can do here in a very good way. Uh, this has been tried before um, but the way they're doing it uh, is, is much better than some of the methods that have been tried in the past. But it's important to point out that setcomp by itself is not a sandbox. It's purely made to just limit the attack surface to things that your app really doesn't need to have. So you can also, s not only can you filter on certain syscalls like this process, it's just crunching numbers. So it just needs to call, you know, um, return and open and that's it. Uh, and, but you can actually control the arguments to those syscalls uh, and say, you know, it only needs to open this file or it needs to, it can only do these flags on this file. Um, and so that's pretty powerful, right? Uh, you do encounter a performance hit. So when you've got a lot of filters, there will be some impact. Uh, I think that's, we're still kind of figuring out what that is and how to optimize it. Uh, but it definitely is something to consider if you're going to be rolling it out. Um, and right now you will need LXC or use MiniJL directly or use MBox or something like that. You can't, uh, if you're going to use Docker with setcomp, you have to use the slash contrib or wait till 1.8, uh, which I think is when they're going to actually launch setcomp support. Uh, but LXC has it right now and you can use, you can use it. Uh, it's typically done through the PR control. Um, you basically can set one of two flags, the uh, strict mode, which I think is only four or five syscalls, uh, which should be used for just like a, you know, 
once you get your process into a spot where it's just going to be crunching numbers or doing something very basic, you can put that on there. Or you can filter, and, and by filter I mean uh, a Berkeley Facet filter, uh, which everybody remembers um, from TCP dump. This is how you would use SetComp in an actual program uh, directly. Uh, and Berkeley packet filter is pretty cool. You can actually use TCP dump to dump out um, some of the uh, um, some of the uh, the language that that um, I don't really know how it works uh, underneath, but it's cool that you can see it. So where is that comp being used right now? Uh, lots of places. Uh, you can turn it on in lots of places at least. It's not necessarily on by default. Uh, it is definitely in Chrome, uh, and they've been doing a lot of good work. It's also in Tor, but it's not on by default. Um, so uh, containers, you know, who's doing these, right? So Docker, obviously, CoreOS, they have Rocket. Um, there's lots of uh, interesting other companies that are either doing these in the background or they're offering them as a service uh, or they're going to be offering this as, as a service. Uh, you know, big shout out actually to the sandstorm.io guys. They have a crazy, um, like, customized system and they do GRSec for everything. Uh, and they're super serious about security and, and uh, and everything else. And also the uh, Rancher OS is an interesting idea where everything in that, that kind of minimal um, system runs in a container. Uh, it's also funny, uh, I don't know if this has been fixed or not, but when you would Google that, uh, it would actually bring up uh, Huevos Rancheros. Uh, Google would fix it. Um, so yeah, they might have some, some SEO problems. But we're, you know, we're really here to talk about the big two, right? So Docker. Uh, when I usually mention Docker, you know, this is the response. I'm from Silicon Valley. Uh, so, you know, this is usually the, the response I get from some devs. Uh, it's really packaging and kind of development focused. Uh, but one thing that is really good about that, I think, is that it's, it's also very app focused. So the, the, the kind of the philosophy of Docker is that it's, it's not just a container with, you know, some things in it. It's just, it's, it's ideally one process in that container and that's it. Uh, and that, you know, as a security person, I really like that because then, not only is it that one process in that container, but it's that one process with just the libraries that it needs and just the files it needs and nothing else. And so you really are cutting off a lot of uh, attack service there. Um, and the, you know, the big deal about Docker and, and why it's gotten so popular is that it really makes containers easy, right? LXC was kind of doing it, you know, uh, in kind of the harder mode, uh, whereas Docker is, you know, uh, uh, you know, you just do Docker pull and magic happens. Um, but Docker isn't just containers, right? So there's all these other things that they've done. Um, it used to be based off of LXC. Now they have something called libcontainers written in Go. Uh, they also have libchan and libswarm and all these other things. Um, they have a REST API. It's, it, by default, it uses a Unix socket, but you can turn on a REST API. Uh, it also, uh, one of the kind of downsides of it um, that, that they're working on fixing, I think, is related to the fact that, you know, there's this root daemon that runs and everything, all your containers and everything from that goes under that daemon uh, and runs, that runs as root. You have to be root to interact with it, which then makes people run as root on, on the, on the uh, container host and, that, you know, that's never a good thing. Um, so, you know, you, you can pull down your images, you can map things from the host into your, into your container. There's this, I also have this idea of Docker Hub, which is kind of like GitHub for containers. Uh, you know, you can do commits and all this stuff. And there's all the, you know, orchestration, communication and management. Um, I don't think the word orchestration was really mentioned much all at all in the last, uh, you know, hundred years, except for maybe last year. Anyway, so CoreOS is the other big one. It's really started out as a minimal OS for hosting containers. Uh, they're launching Rocket and this app container spec. They're trying to kind of distance themselves from LXC and, Rock and, and Docker. Uh, their kind of main idea is that they're trying to be more secure and lean and be what Docker should be or used to be. Uh, and, but you know, why would anybody use any of these systems? Um, and it's mostly just to make it easy, right? Or, or to package a lot of the, the functionality with it. And one way that you might kind of relate to it is, you know, you can run for EBSD and you can secure that, but you kind of need to know what you're doing. Or you can run OS 10 and it's easy and it's kind of BSD still, but you kind of have to take some things, uh, you know, for, uh, for granted about control. And so, you know, LXC, it's kind of vanilla, it lets you do whatever you want, and you do get some bleeding edge there, um, but you kind of have to know what you're doing in order to, to do everything correctly, especially based on the defaults. Whereas Docker, you know, they do a lot of stuff for you, they drop most of the capabilities that you don't need, but they still leave some around, and you need to kind of explicitly disable those if your app doesn't need them. And we'll get into that. So, you know, LXC, 
hard mode, but you got flexibility. Docker, easy, but you know you have some costs or some risks. CoreOS, uh, it's new. Uh, it's, very, it's very, very new. Uh, we'll get to that. So, but we're here to talk about attacks, right? That's all, that's all just stuff. So if you think about this, there's a lot of different ways that we can go about thinking about what are the attacks in a container or what should I be worried about? So there's containers to other containers, there's things in the container you know, against itself essentially, trying to elevate your privileges within a container if you're not just a single process. Uh, you know, container to the ho container host, uh, you know, things supporting infrastructure, whether that's orchestration and all that other stuff or whether you know, that's other things on the network and you can go from there. So kind of starting at the top, you know, the, the kernel obviously is doing all this virtualization stuff. Uh, so in the kernel, you've got all these old drivers, you've got all this old code, you've got weird file system support. Pretty much nobody compiles a kernel from scratch anymore that doesn't have all this bloaty stuff that you probably don't even need. Um, which means you're also inheriting all those vulnerabilities of some random CAN bus, uh, you know, special CAN bus driver thing in Linux that you don't use on your server. Uh, the other way that this kind of typically goes bad is not dropping capabilities. Uh, so capnet admin is kind of a bad offender. Uh, there's been I don't know how many different CVEs of documentation of, and vulnerabilities where you can go from capnet admin to something else that you shouldn't be doing uh, that isn't related to networking. Uh, you know, the, the way that's happened in a lot of cases is being able to force capnet admin to load an arbitrary kernel module uh, that then you then control. That was, I think, one of the worst cases. But you know, speaking of dropping capabilities, Docker was really stung by this. Uh, so they kept around for a long time uh, the cap DAC read search capability. And if you read the man page, and maybe this is what they did, you know, it says something like, you know, uh, you can um, uh, read some files related to, you know, permissions. Uh, you can also o invoke open handle at, which is a uh, syscall that doesn't really have a ton of documentation. They probably thought, oh, whatever. Uh, but it turns out that if you actually use that syscall uh, and you do some other tricks based on inodes and other things, you can essentially brute force the inode uh, of Etsy shadow in the host and read it from inside the container. And obviously there's other attacks you can do related to that. Uh, but, you know, that was something that really gave the, the capability model uh, a, a good example of why you need to drop the ones that you don't really need because they're complicated. And you know, if you don't drop those capabilities, you have to rely on some other thing to, to um, you know, enforce the rules on your container. And you know, that's typically done through a mandatory access control system like SE Linux or AppArmor. Uh, but if you don't use that, the capabilities are your only line of defense because if you're root in a container, you're still root on a host. Uh, unless you're using the user namespace, which again doesn't have a ton of support yet uh, or, or um, adoption. You also have the problem of limiting access. So we mentioned how the kernel, uh, there's not a namespace for proc or there's not a namespace for dev. And so what happens is you have things in the kernel or things in the container that are exposed from the host or that bridge the host and the container. So things like proc k core uh, where you can expose the kernel memory uh, into the container. Um, you have things like, uh, you know, sysrec, which everyone forgets about, but stung, um, you know, LXC for a number of years, uh, where they, you know, were leaving that uh, open. You also have things like being able to make new devices, or even just CD message, right? That's not a ton of uh, attack surface there, but you know, you're leaking things like maybe firewall rules or other stuff, um, and then unintended access to the network, right? So a lot of these container systems use a bridge system by default. If you remember networking 101, a bridge is a switch. So uh, most of the default systems by I think almost all the containers will create a bridge and let your containers talk to each other. And that isn't something that most people realize when they deploy five containers on a host. They don't think that all those containers will be able to communicate, but they can unless you've written firewall rules or switched to some other networking type. You also, uh, you know, see people not limiting any resources. Obviously, if you fork bomb a container with my favorite bash function there, uh, you're going to be fork bombing the host. And then, kind of, some other things relating to, you know, Docker has been uh, stung by this a couple times. Of, you know, this idea of taking your pack, taking your application, packaging it all up with the libraries that you need, putting a lock on it, and shipping it off everywhere. Uh, you know that is, doesn't really happen. What happens when there's a vulnerability in one of those libraries or that application and you need to update it? 
what do you do? You know, you can't just, you're not supposed, supposed to run app get upgrade on your containers. It's kind of a no-no in the container world because they're supposed to be ephemeral and immutable. Um, and so what do you do? And so you kind of need to define, to, to uh, have a system to, to adopt that, have a patching system. Um, and then the, the lack of mandatory access control. So most of the container systems also have some form of app armor support or SE Linux support uh, that works quite well. Obviously it's not perfect. There's been some bugs even very recently that were published there. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the kernel is still enforcing things. So this isn't a perfect solution either. And really it should just be one facet of many uh, different things. Um, and we mentioned that the networking defaults uh, and how that can be bad. Um, for LXC specifically, the defaults uh, are quite bad for dropping capabilities, but that kind of relates to the way that the model of LXC is you have a minimal container, but it's not supposed to really just be a single process. Um, it's supposed to be, you know, a few different things, maybe, a, maybe an SSH daemon or system D or something like that, whereas Docker is, you know, the idea of one process. But speaking of Docker, so Docker does a pretty good job of dropping capabilities, but if you read the, between the lines, they mention that they, they drop all the capabilities except for those required. Um, but if they don't know what you're going to be running, how do they know the ones that are still required? Um, and then, uh, you know, you have to be root to use it. So that ends up being kind of bad. I've been on a number of engagements where there's been a, you know, people have been added to the Docker group. Um, but, you know, if you're in the Docker group, you can essentially root the host uh, trivially. Um, there's also things like the REST API by default doesn't have authentication. So if you've turned that on and it's bound to all interfaces, then you have some problem where, you know, some outside um, attacker can get to it or, you know, some server-side request forgery or some other thing where you can get to that um, system. And it could even be exposed to containers through that bridge system if you don't have a firewall. And then it also has the kind of GitHub all the way down problem, which I think is not just Docker uh, has the problem where, you know, you've got something like it's including these from these five vendors and they just accept commit requests from these five other random people on GitHub uh, and all that code is just being chained down to some kid in a basement and he doesn't know that the code he's committing is going into data centers and, you know, a crazy company uh, and all it would take would be one commit. Um, there's been backdoored AMIs published before, so we'll see what happens with, uh, with GitHub and all that. Um, it also, you know, I mentioned it doesn't drop all the capabilities. You know, mo by default, it still keeps cap net raw. It still keeps um, cap f owner. Um, you can still make devices in your container. You're going to be limited by app armor, but it, you know, th most of the time, your app probably isn't going to need those, so you should drop them. Um, when you bind a port to Docker by default, it binds it to um, all the interfaces. Uh, and so, if you have a multiple interfaces that you're exposing to your container, it's going to be on all of those. Um, there's some other things related to, you know, base images are also really huge. So a lot of people in their Docker file, their Docker file, which is, you know, the, the main way of spinning up your Docker image, they'll, uh, you know, from Ubuntu or something like that, but that pulls in like 250 megabytes of packages that, you know, you don't need. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a problem where you think you're just running a single process in that container, but really there's a whole bunch of other stuff there that could be used to try to attack or break out of that container. Um, I mentioned giving the, the uh, um, you know, giving users access to the Docker user or the Docker group on a host, you know, is essentially giving them root. Uh, it doesn't have support right now for a set comp or user namespaces, which are two, you know, really uh, critical security uh, benefits, but it will very soon. I think 1.8 is that they, what they've mentioned about that. Um, and uh, the other thing I've mentioned uh, that I've seen on GitHub is, people for trying to do introspection with their container, if they have the, something in the container be able to see, you know, what's going on with itself, they'll expose the Docker socket inside the container. D don't do that. Um, that's giving your container root on your, your host. Uh, and speaking of the, the user namespace, I have to kind of poke at them a little bit more. Uh, they mentioned on Hacker News uh, that, you know, uh, I'm the maintainer of Docker, um, you know, we, we will soon have support for user namespaces. Um, when we feel comfortable that Docker can run um, UID untrusted zero, we will say so clearly. Um, that was a year ago. Uh, no, probably more a year than a year ago now, um, and they still don't have it. Uh, to give them a little credit though, I think that um, one of the major reasons why they don't have the user namespace is I was actually a limitation of Go, um, and not necessarily their fault, but um, they're, they're on it now, and so uh, hopefully it'll be soon. 
Also, every, every container talk has to have an image of some broken container, so um, I can check that box. So Rocket is the other one that kind of came on the stage. Uh, it's still, uh, you know, their whole selling point was that there's no root daemon, you know, it's just a binary that you can run and it does the stuff, but there's no thing that's running on your host. Um, it still requires root to run it, uh, so it's, I don't know if they've really solved the problem. Um, it also doesn't drop almost any of the dangerous capabilities. Uh, it also doesn't support the user namespace. Um, let's see, what else? Oh yeah, it doesn't support SecOM, it doesn't support AppArmor. Uh, kind of supports SE Linux, but there's no documentation. Uh, for a long time they had a bug where you couldn't actually run things inside a container without running them as root inside the container, which just seems crazy. Uh, they don't have a lot of limits they should on proc or proc sys. So, um, you know, if you read the documentation, uh, they have this very impressive design with this multi-stage system. Um, and it sounds really good, but unfortunately I think this is the current implementation. Um, and uh, you know, I, I hope it improves because I like to see competition, but I think right now this is where they're at. Uh, so then very recently there was, uh, I think at DockerCon 15, they announced the Open Container Project. Uh, I was really, really bummed that they didn't go with this logo um, because it's, it's awesome uh, and a great movie. Uh, so they, cha they actually changed their name um, to the Open Container Initiative. Uh, and they really have this, this uh, specification for containers and kind of just standardize the system and, and not have all these different kind of competing things. They, uh, they launched something called Run C, uh, which is a very, very minimal container. It essentially is a kind of competition for Rocket. Uh, it's very minimal, you know, you just define your container with a JSON file or something like that. And then um, it's backed by libcontainer, which is supported by Docker and some other people. Um, but they still are not working on RoboCop. That's sad. Uh, so, you know, all that stuff sounds kind of bad and messed up and, you know, what can we do? So, there's a lot of recommendations I have. Uh, I'm actually have a ton of stuff in a white paper um, that uh, I'm going to be publishing really soon. Um, so, I kind of designed my slides to be somewhat of high, high level of each area. Uh, but the white paper goes into a ton of detail, all this stuff. But really the, the big message is defense in depth. Uh, and I know everybody says that and you know, I can toot that horn a bunch. But really, you know, if, you, if you're trying to defend against things, you want to build your defenses in layers. And that's really the only way you're going to do it. So if we're going to do that, we want to start with the kernel because uh, it's got a kernel. Uh, so you want to do GR security. Like just everyone should be running it. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, especially on a, on a, on a server where there's no special hardware, you know, sometimes on a laptop GR security can be a little tricky with drivers or whatever it may be. Um, but on a server when you're just running a few things uh, or you're doing containers, just do it. Um, and so, you know, obviously hardening your kernel in other ways. Uh, dropping all the capabilities that you don't want, trying to design for the smallest possible set and then also assuming the worst. So you're giving these capabilities out but you want to be careful about what they are and try to fully understand what each capability really can do. You also want to use AppArmor or uh, Jira Security RBAC or, or SMAC or some other thing. Uh, if you can, most of the container systems will uh, have AppArmor by default enabled uh, which is awesome. Uh, it also can be nested, so that's kind of crazy to think about, but you can create an AppArmor profile for a container and then in that container if you want to then have something be able to apply a secondary but limited AppArmor profile that's a restricted subset of that first one, uh, you can do that. That's kind of neat. Uh, for Docker specifically, you know, you don't want to allow users uh, to run Docker if you don't want to give them root on that host. Uh, you don't want to run containers that are privileged or containers that are root. Uh, as we've seen either, you know, using an IP tables trick or using um, the CapNet bind service, you don't need to, you do not need to be root to bind to lower the 1024. That's, you know, if you, if you, uh, I don't know how many times you've been on a project, I'm sure you guys know, but you've been on a project or you've looked at some security of something and the only reason why they're running as root is because they need to bind to port 80 or 443 and that's just stupid and that doesn't exist anymore um, and nobody should be doing it. Um, using small base images is also cool. There's a really good talk about building a uh, crazy tiny Go um, Docker image. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, that's going to be documented. Um, using seccomp if you can. So, you know, right now uh, with LXC, you can use a whitelist of syscalls that you want to app your, you want to allow your app to be able to call. Uh, 
Um, that can really cut off a ton of attack surface on ways that the, you know, the kernel is, is typically uh, you know, accessed. Um, you want to do all your normal system hardening, right? That's a long list of things, but there's a lot of stuff to do there, and that's you know, what should be done. You want to avoid uh, things that are listening on all interfaces, or just keep that in mind, you know, that, that cross-container um, networking. The other, thing to, the other thing that's cool about containers is if you have these different uh, um, interfaces, it's really easy to tell what's going in and out of my processes uh, in that container, and so it can be great for, for trace flow. So the kind of the core picture is, you know, you've got this hardened application. Then under that, you've got your user namespace, your user namespace, you've dropped capabilities. Then you have mount protections, right? Let's say that container is read only except for maybe like uh, the log files or something like that. And then um, you've got a minimal container distro, and then you do seccom filtering, and then you've got uh, GR security, and then you can even do, you know, uh, hypervisor or some other kind of. Um, virtual machine to gain some like actual hardware separation and then you isolate that whole thing by some trust that you give it and then you do that differently for other things so you know your uh, containers that are that are getting hit by your API that are on the front end of your system those should be treated with different trust than the, some container back end that has your database right you don't want to have those on the same system if you can avoid it even in separate hardware VMs um, that that's not ideal so where do we go from here, right? So more namespaces hopefully will be coming uh, that'll help clear that up a little bit. Some of the, the, the edge cases where, you know, proc right now is kind of a shit show. Uh, minimal hypervisors, right? So there was a thing recently where Intel came out with this thing called clear containers, which is essentially like a 20 megabyte hypervisor uh, that will give you some hardware virtualization aspects that you can apply to containers. That's a really cool hybrid model that I think is going to be neat to explore. Um, more, more minimal container distros will probably be coming out soon uh, or more be uh, more refined going forward. Um, and also, you know, uh, these, this, because this is Linux on Linux and it can be, most of these features can be implemented anywhere Linux can run, you can actually do this kind of stuff on embedded devices. You can do these kinds of th isolation mechanisms or run containers on a phone or on a whatever, whereas, you know, virtualization or, or other things uh, is, is less uh, capable there. There's also, you know, we've talked a lot about servers, but really there's no reason why desktop Linux uh, can't benefit from, from all these isolation mechanisms or using containers. So hopefully, uh, you know, th there's a lot more efforts there. You know, I, I personally run everything in a container that speaks anything externally or that uh, parses anything from the outside. Uh, so there's all this microservices idea, uh, which is, is somewhat new. Um, it's kind of cool. You end up something with something that looks like this. Um, I think one of the ways that's neat about it is that actually isn't a microservices uh, picture. That's the Chrome sandbox. And so if you think about it, the way that microservices, the idea of them, you know, splitting up everything into a hundred different REST APIs, that sounds like a pain in the ass, um, but really it lets you do a lot of least privileges and least access and, you know, you can do a lot of crazy cool security where everyone always draws this, you know, all these boxes on a whiteboard of this is what our system looks like, but at the end of the day, there's a whole bunch of other pieces that, that get connected there and they don't have the security they should. It's not just, you know, my auth service talks to the database. It also could talk to some other thing because nobody writes firewall rules for all that stuff. So, you know, the, the microservices model is, you know, this kind of, uh, you're splitting everything up into pieces, running it all in little containers, um, having, um, you know, message queues and all kinds of things. Unfortunately, you know, it starts off with something kind of like this and ends up something like this uh, when it gets implemented. So really, you know, it's not about perfect security. Containers, you know, you can't just drop that and, and think you have security, but it's, it's improving the work, right? The, the number of times that I've been on a pen test or, or some red team or something, and I've been stopped by popping something and then having it be inside a sandbox or a container is close to zero. Uh, and that's just silly these days because it's, it's not that hard to do containers. Um, it can secure a lot of existing systems that are Linux, you know, uh, and the microservices architecture is, you know, it's coming, it's going to be adding, there's going to be, that's going to be a lot more popular, and I actually like it from the, the security aspects of it. Uh, so coming soon, so my white paper is coming out, it covers everything that I've talked about in a whole lot more depth. Uh, it covers, you know, all kinds of past attacks and looking at new areas and everything, um, and hopefully uh, it'll be released soon. 
Um, if you want to make sure that you get it, uh, I'm going to be writing everybody that emails me in a, in a text file. You can follow me on Twitter and I'll talk about it at some point. Um, but yeah, are there any, uh, any questions or comments? Yeah. <laughs> Three. And I'll be around after, you know, this is the last talk. And thanks a lot for, uh, for hanging out and, you know, it's, it's kind of late, but I appreciate it.